after some search, General Pichiger was apprehended. He was first interrogated alone. And as he adopted the system of an absolute denial, it was found necessary to confront him successively with all those of George's subordinates who had been arrested. It was not till then that he was ascertained to be the mysterious personage who had come every fortnight to George's and in whose presence everyone assumed a respectful attitude. He was also recognized by George's servant as the person who had gone with him into the hackney coach to the rendezvous of La Madeleine. The luminous information furnished by this confrontation could not but astonish Monsieur Riel in the highest degree. He lost no time in making his report to the First Consul, who became thoughtful and who expressed by an exclamation of sorrow the regret which he felt at having consented to the seizure of the Duc d'Anguin. It was too late. The First Consul could not but be deeply interested in having this affair elucidated, and yet he enjoined secrecy, either because this appeared most conducive to the interest of his policy, or because he chose rather not to make known the mistake into which he had fallen. Our history, however, is not destitute of examples of justice itself having been an error. The religion of the parliaments, the composition of which forbade any suspicion of its rigid equity, has sometimes been abused, and condemnations that were afterwards deplored have been the consequences. I have since frequently heard the emperor thus express himself before his ministers. Gentlemen, I am a minor. It is your duty to inform yourselves before you report to me. But when once I have your signature, so much the worse for you if an innocent person suffers. And he has often repeated the same words to me with reference to the reports which I have had occasion to submit to him in the course of my administration. Chapter 7. The presence of Pichigrew in George Cadoul's conspiracy seriously compromised Moreau inasmuch as it afforded room to suppose that there was some connection between them. The next question to be resolved was how these two persons could have come together. Means were dexterously contrived to convict General Moreau of having seen Pichigrew. As he was unacquainted with the progress of the examinations, he perceived none of the snares that were laid for him. He admitted that Pichigrew had come to his house and that it was General Lajolet who had brought him, but that for fear of compromising himself, he had not admitted him any more. And yet, he had seen him elsewhere. He was asked where. I do not exactly recollect, replied he, except once at the Boulevard de la Madeleine at nine in the evening. Being questioned respecting the manner of this meeting, he answered that he knew nothing about it, that General Lajolet had come to fetch him and conducted him to the boulevard, and that after leaving him for a moment, he had rejoined him and taken General Pichigrew along with him. He was not examined further on this point, but Lajolet was taken aside, and after being questioned and cross-questioned, it was ascertained that he had gone from George is lodging in a hackney coach with George and Peach to grow on the back seat himself, Lachelet and Pico, a trusty attendant of George's on the front, that he had ordered the coachman to drive to the boulevard to La Madeleine, whence he went to fetch Moreau from his house through Danjou, where the latter was waiting for him, that he had conducted him to the foot of the boulevard, that he had then gone to the hackney coach to fetch Peach to grow who had alighted with George, and that he had led them to Moreau, who was walking to and fro till they came up. But then he, La Jolet, had returned to the coach, in which he remained during the whole time that this interview lasted. Pico confirmed this deposition of La Jolet's and added that when his master had returned to the coach with Pichigrou, he had heard the latter speaking of Moreau say, as I have already related, it seems that fellow has ambition too. Neither George nor Moreau would admit the particulars of this interview to all the questions that were asked. George replied, I don't know what you mean. And Moreau said, I have never seen George. As Pichigrou was just dead, it was impossible to obtain any greater certainty respecting the circumstance of this affair, which might implicate General Moreau. I have said that Pichigrou was just dead. His death has given rise to so many reports equally stupid and calumnious that it needs some explanation. What I know about it is this. Pichigrew, after his apprehension, had been closely confined in one of the ground floor rooms in the tower of the temple. His examination was deferred a few days in order to gain time to collect the materials for his interrogatory, and this delay proved fatal to the Duke Dungeon. 
Pichigru was separated from George merely by a small room, which was the common antechamber to their abode. The keeper of the temple had the key to their rooms and who prevent their communicating to each other the questions put to them severally by the Jug instructor. The same judge had directed a sentinel to be placed in the antechamber, where, by means of a little noise, any conversation which they might have attempted to keep up could be rendered ineffectual. Both were sent for several times a day to be confronted, that is to say, whenever they were implicated by a fresh deposition of the accused or of witnesses. George had doubtless made up his mind respecting the issue of the proceedings, but General Pichigrew, with different proceedings, circumstances, probably felt himself in a different predicament. Every time that he was sent for into court, he perceived that his situation grew worse and that an abyss was opening before him at every step, and he could not help changing countenance. He had perhaps flattered himself that in the judicial investigation of this affair, it might not be possible to obtain sufficient proofs of his participation in a crime against which the public opinion of all France revolted en masse. But he must soon have been convinced that it would be impracticable for him to touch the sensibility of even the most generous hearts, and that moreover his presence before criminal court as a cooperator in George's project would carry back the conviction of his guilt to the circumstance in which Moreau had denounced him to the directory in 1796 or 1797, after the latter had caused him to be transported to K.N., and that he would thus lose even the interest which some of his assembled friends had manifested for him at that period of his career. I presume that this afflicting consideration continually present in his mind, beneath the vault of his prison, powerfully influenced his determination to put an end to his life. General Pichigru was naturally gay and fond of the pleasures of the table, but the horrors of his situation had altered him. He had sent to request Monsieur Real to come and see him. And after the conversation which he had with him, he begged that he would send him some books and, among others, Seneca. Some days afterwards, being at the Tuileries, about 8 o'clock in the morning, I received a note from the officer of the Gendarmerie d'Elite, who that day commanded the guard posted at the temple. He informed me that General Pichigru had just been found dead in his bed and that this had occasioned a great bustle in the temple where they were expecting someone from the police to which intelligence of the circumstance had been sent. This officer communicated the fact to me as well on account of singularity as because I had made it a rule in the court which I commanded that all the officers employed in any duty whatever should give me an account of what they had done, seen, or heard during the 24 hours. I forwarded this note to the first consul. He sent for me, supposing that I had further particulars. But as I had none, he sent me to make inquiries, saying, This is a pretty end for the conqueror of Holland. I arrived at the temple at the same time as Monsieur Riel, who came on behalf of the Grand Judge to learn the particulars of this event. I went with Monsieur Riel, the keeper and the surgeon of the prison, straight to General Pichigrou's room, and I knew him again very well, though his face was turned of a crimson color from the effect of the apoplexy with which he had been struck. His room was on the ground floor and the head of his bed against the window so that the seat served to set his light upon for the purpose of reading in bed. On the outside, there was a sentinel placed under his window through which he might easily, upon occasion, see all that was passing in the room. General Pichigrou was lying on his right side. He had put round his neck his own black silk cravat, which he had previously twisted like a small rope. This must have occupied him so long as to afford time for reflection. Had he not been resolutely bent on self-destruction, he appeared to have tied his cravat thus twisted about his neck, and to have it first drawn it as tight as he could bear it, then to have taken a piece of wood of the length of a finger which he had broken from a branch that yet lay in the middle of the room, part of a faggot, the relics of which were still in his fireplace. This he must have slipped between his neck and the cravat on the right side and turned round till the moment that reason forsook him. His head had fallen back in the pillow and compressed the little bit of stick which had prevented the cravat from untwisting. In this situation, apoplexy could not fail to supervene. His hand was still under his head and almost touched his little tourniquet. On the night table was a book open and with its back upward as if laid down for a moment by one who had been interrupted while reading. 
Mr. Real found this book to be the Seneca which he had sent him. And he remarked that it was open at that passage where Seneca says that the man who is determined to conspire ought above all things not to fear death. This was probably the last thing read by General P. Chagru, who, having placed himself in a situation to lose his life on the scaffold or under the necessity of having recourse to the clemency of the first consul, had preferred dying by his own hand. While I was at the temple, I questioned a gendarme who had passed the night in the antechamber which separated George from Pichigrew. He told me that he had heard nothing all night, except that General Pichigrew had coughed a good deal from 11 to 12 o'clock, that not being able to get into his room because the keeper had the key, he was unwilling to rouse the whole tower on account of that cough. The gendarme was himself locked up in this antechamber and had anything occurred to oblige him to give the alarm. It was by the window that he was to apprise the sentinel who was at the door of the tower. The sentinel was to give notice to the post and the latter to the keeper. I questioned also the gendarme who had been on duty under the window of General Pichigrew from 10 o'clock till 12, and he'd heard nothing. Mr. Real then said to me, well, though, nothing was ever more clearly proved than this suicide. Yet in spite of all we could do, it will be said that because he could not be convicted, he has been strangled. For this reason, the grand judge determined from that moment to have a guard without arms placed in the room of each of the persons implicated in George's business to prevent any attempt on their own lives. Of course, no such thing was ever thought of so as to take them away by secret executions. Party spirit, which always welcomes whatever is likely to be prejudicial to power. Publicly circulated report that Pichigrew was strangled by gendarmes. This opinion attained to such a degree that a high functionary friend of mine mentioned it several afterwards. Several years afterwards, as a fact of which he had not the least doubt. And notwithstanding all I could say to convince him of the contrary, I'm not sure that I succeeded. For the rest, it was not from a carping disposition that he had adopted this opinion. He had heard it repeated so often that he at length believed it. It would have argued an absolute want of sound sense to employ for such an office subordinate persons who would have divulged this crime on the first occasion of discontent or who would every day have set a fresh price in their silence. There was no necessity to destroy Pichagro. His presence was even requisite for the instruction of the process. Besides having come to France with George, he was inseparable from him before justice, which would not have failed to condemn him in spite of the talents of the ablest advocate. But I cannot think that the first consul would have suffered him to perish of this. I need no other proof than the pardon which he granted to those who were condemned to death in this affair and who had nothing to recommend them to the public opinion, as was the case with the conqueror of Holland. Besides Pichigrew, condemned in a criminal court before the face of the world could no longer prove dangerous and would have been worthy of pity alone. If under these circumstances there was any one whom it would have been desirable to put out of the way by extraordinary means, that one was Moreau, who was far more formidable to the first consul than Pichigrew and who had not injured himself in the public estimation by coming from England. The three persons whom France may interrogate respecting this event are first, the keeper of the temple, who is still living. Secondly, Monsieur Manginet, captain of the gendarmerie at the residence of Ivre. He was then irremovable, commandant of the temple. Thirdly, Monsieur Villanger, chef, the squadron of the gendarmerie at the residence of Alençon. He was a lieutenant of the Legion d'Elite. And was that day on duty at the temple? It was he who wrote me the note of which I have made mention above. It was impossible for anyone to enter the tower without his knowledge. Had gendarmes gone in, he must not only have seen them, but he would have known them. For the legion, the elite was not so numerous as that the gendarmes composing it could be unknown to each other. They actually did know one another. It was I who had formed this corps composed of 480 horse and 240 gendarmes on foot, all picked from the entire corps of the gendarmerie. Most of them had been subalterns in the army. I had infused into them all the zeal for the first consul with which I was myself animated, and I had no greater pleasure than in availing myself of the advantages of my situation to do good for them or their relatives. 
their attachment to me assisted me to endure the many vexations brought upon me by a command which was the object of much jealousy. And I feel it to be my duty to declare in the face of the world that I knew not one among them to whom one would have proposed an equivocal mission, while on the contrary most of them were deserving of particular confidence. Out of several instances which I could give, I shall cite the following. Two of them, taken without selection in their regular turn upon the list, were appointed to escort a sum of money from Paris to Naples. The treasurer of the crown delivered it to them, ready packed in a carriage prepared for that purpose. They set out from the court of the palace of the Tuileries and reached Rome without molestation. After quitting that city, they were attacked near Terracina. The two Pastilians having been killed, the robbers came to plunder the carriage, but the two gendarmes plied their weapons with such success that they put the villains to flight, and then mounting the horses themselves, they conveyed the treasure touched to Naples. A gendarme delete, who should have been capable of accepting a mission equivocal for honor, would have been removed from that corps as capable also of betraying the general honor. The officers of this corps had been selected with the same care. I have never had occasion to do otherwise than commend them in all the delicate circumstances in which they have been employed, and that sometimes by the emperor himself. This respectable corps fell a victim in 1814 to the basest calumny. It was the first disbanded. It is to be wished for the sake of the king of France that he may replace it with servants having hearts as honest and as attached to his person as those were to the government which they served. The long instruction of their process was drawing to a close when a strange incident occurred to delay the opening of the judgment. A multitude of depositions had re-echoed the name of the English captain Wright, and the newspapers had talked of him in all sorts of ways. This captain, who had landed George's people at the cliff of Bivilla, had afterwards gone to cruise off the coast of Quiberon. Having had the misfortune to be wrecked on the coast of Morbihan, he was conducted with all his crew to Vannes, where nothing was just then talked of but what was passing in Paris. The administration of that department reported the shipwreck and was ordered to send Captain Wright and all his crew to Paris. They entered the court of the temple. When George and his people were walking there, the English and French officers did not seem to recognize one another, but the English seamen, not supposing there could be any harm in it, frankly accosted some of their acquaintances amongst George's subalterns. Captain Wright was separated from them, and the court proceeded to confront the rest with George's subordinates which confirmed the rigid truth of the information previously obtained. Wright persisted in declining to answer the questions put to him and said, Gentlemen, I am an officer in the British Navy. I care not what treatment you reserve for me. I shall give no account of the orders which I have received. I know none of these gentlemen. From whom then could Wright, an officer in the Royal Navy of England, and moreover commanding a ship of war of that navy, I received orders to take on board George and his people and to land them on our coast. Is there in England any other authority which issues orders to the naval, the Navy, than the government offices? Captain Wright had been thrown upon the coast by shipwreck. Instead of making him a prisoner of war, a criminal prosecution might have been instituted against him by the procureur general on the ground of his being an accomplice in the conspiracy. Regard was nevertheless had to his devotedness in his character he and his men were brought forward as witnesses but no proceedings against them personally were commenced this unfortunate man remained in the temple until 1805 when he died so many stories have been told concerning his death that i too was curious to learn the cause of it when as minister of police the sources of information were open to me and i ascertained that wright cut his throat in despair after reading the account of the capitulation of the austrian general mac at ulm that is while the emperor was Engaged in the campaign of Austerlitz, can one in fact, without a like insulting common sense and glory, admit that this sovereign had attached so much importance to the destruction of a scurvy lieutenant of the English Navy as to send from one of his most glorious fields of battle the order for his destruction? It has been added that it was I who received from him this commission. Now I never quitted him for a single day during the whole campaign.
from his departure from Paris till his return. For the rest, the civil administration of France is in possession of all the papers of the Ministry of the Police, which must furnish all the information that can be desired respecting that event. Chapter 8. The famous trial of George, so eagerly expected, at length commenced. The palace of justice was beset by an innumerable concourse of people composed of individuals of all classes and all opinions, who thronged thither to make their observations. Persons of the better sort, who were also to be seen there, were not carried thither by curiosity alone. The spirit of opposition was a principal ingredient in the interest which attracted the greater part of the people of all ranks who attended all the sittings, and this opposition was not silent. The story circulated respecting the death of the Duc Dongin, and that of Pichagru had produced audacity, and public opinion was loudly expressed. The pleadings lasted 12 days. They were constantly attended by a crowd which filled all the avenues of the palace. A fault had been committed in persuading the First Consul to agree to the suppression of the jury for this occasion only in consequence of the alarm, whether well or ill-founded, excited by the language held... Since the catastrophe of the Duke Duncan, this measure, though vigorous, produced a bad effect and awakened still more distrust in the public mind in general. The pleadings in the affair of General Moreau were awaited with impatience. At length, they were open. His advocate was elo eloquent and found in history an apposite quotation in the work of the president of Thou. He dwelt on the ignominy with which the Lombardement had covered himself, but he passed over the interview at the Boulevard de la Madeleine with all the rapidity allowed by the denial of Moreau, the silence of George, and the death of Pichagru. This, in fact, it was that saved him. I was present at the sitting. The public was all eye and all ear. Moreau admitted that General Lajolais had come to his house for him, conducted him to the Boulevard de la Madeleine, fetched Pichagru from the hackney coach and brought him to the spot where Moreau was walking. La Jolie acknowledged all this to be true, but added, George was with Pichagru. You knew that he was to be there, and he alighted from the coach with Pichagru. Pico, a trusty attendant of George's, said, I was with George when he got out of the coach with Pichagru, and I stayed in the coach with La Jolie, who got in again till they came back and rejoined us. Nothing could be more clearly proved than this truth, but as it luckily happened, no doubt in this case, two and two do not always make four. Nevertheless, Moreau was obliged to affirm upon oath that he had not seen George. All eyes were fixed upon him. The spectators suffered on account of what he must have suffered, but at length he swore that he had not seen George. And assuredly, he did very right. But ought the conqueror of Hohenlinden to have placed himself in this situation? The guilt of the other accused persons was too evident to leave room for hope. They were all condemned. It was useless to suppress the jury for the very same day that Moreau was sworn. I saw a very clever man who said aloud in the court, had I been on the jury, I should have declared Moreau guilty on such depositions as that of La Jolet and Pico. He was nevertheless sentenced jointly with the girl Ize to two years imprisonment. The audience burst into a laugh on hearing this ridiculous sentence. The girl Ize was a poor creature who, to the kindness which she had shown for one or two of the least important persons at George's party, had added that of going on all sorts of errands for them. Can any rational man persuade himself that in a conspiracy all the circumstances of which are proved and which aims at the overthrow of a state for the success of which the actors think that they need the concurrence of one of the principal leaders of the army who gives his consent to it because he has seen the conspirators and admitted them into his house, but who, it is true, has fettered his participation with restrictions which have suspended the enterprise and perhaps caused it to miscarry. Can, I say, any rational man believe that this chief had no more share in this conspiracy than could have been taken by a pothouse girl? Such a supposition would revolt the meanest understanding. Either Moreau was not guilty, and then the court ought to have the courage loudly to declare his innocence and to send him home in triumph, or he was guilty. And in this case, he was more guilty than George. For George was at least acting up to his principles. Whereas Moreau, after denouncing to the directory, subsequently to the 18th Fruit de Dor, the correspondence between Pichagro and the Prince of Conde behaved a thousand times worse than Pichagro. 
At this period, he led himself to an assassination and to a manifest treason after he had pledged his faith to his country. But such is blind passion. He had been slighted at the time when he denounced Bishagru, and the latter had been exalted into a hero. It has been strongly asserted that the members of the criminal court, being thoroughly acquainted with the Republican opinions of Moreau, had given him the benefit of them, and that a brother of General de Corbes, a partisan of Moreau's, who was a member of the criminal court assisted by Mr. Fouché, had gained over many voices in favor of Moreau. I know nothing of the matter, but something of the sort must have taken place. He was advised to ask permission to go to America. The first consul granted it the same day. Moreau quitted the temple at night. After taking leave of his family, he was conducted to Barcelona and embarked in a Spanish port for America. I have since seen an Englishman who knew Moreau when he commanded the army of the Rhine and afterwards met with him again in America. He told me that he had heard him congratulate himself on having got off so well as he did. And that he, moreover, expressed his astonishment that the police had not sooner discovered his intercourse with Pichagru because he supposed that he was strictly watched. And on this subject, he related the following anecdote. It is given in Moreau's own, own words. Pichagru had already been some time in Paris, and we were in the habit of seeing each other every night. When he came to my house, he was accustomed to ask for one of my servants, who was the only one that knew him and whom... I had ordered to be always in readiness to receive him and to usher him into my cabinet, whither I went to join him. If I was not there already, it once happened that when my drawing room was full of company, who had dined with me, Pichagru came earlier than usual. Not finding upon the stairs a servant who was in the habit of waiting for him there, he went up to the antechamber, and not meeting with anyone there either, he opened the drawing room door, but seeing it full of company, he immediately drew back. Luckily, he had not been perceived by any person but my wife, who had turned her head towards the door at the moment of its opening and recognized him. I instantly retired and conducted him myself to my cabinet, where we remained part of the evening. Next day, I had a sharp altercation with my wife, who insisted that I was ruining myself because General Pichagru could scarcely have come to Paris for any other purpose than to engage in some enterprise in favor of the Bourbons. And whenever he should have no further occasion for me, he would make me repent what I had written against him to the directory. She talked to me a long time in this strain, and I was in agony lest she should communicate her grievances to some of her female friends. But it appears that she kept them to herself, for it was not through any indiscretion of hers that the first intelligence of this affair was obtained. Such was the language of General Moreau during the first year of his residence in America while in France. A party was striving to represent him as the victim of a jealousy which his great talents had excited. General Moreau possessed property in France by the sale of which, as it would have been difficult to turn it into money, he must have suffered a considerable loss. The First Consul bought the estate of Grosbois near Paris and gave it to General Bertier, minister at war. He also purchased of him his house in the Rue d'Anjou, which he gave to Bernadotte, as if it had been decreed that this house should not cease to be the focus of conspiracy against him. For these two properties, General Moreau was paid the price which he himself asked, and he was moderate in his demand. It has been generally believed that the First Consul was vexed at the non-condemnation of Moreau. If he was vexed at this result of the trial, on which point I am ignorant, it was no doubt merely because it deprived him of an opportunity to humble Moreau by pardoning him. He was not found of revenging himself by capital punishments. After the condemnation of George and his people, he pardoned several of them at the first application. If I recollect rightly, there were seven pardoned in all. Would he have suffered the conqueror of Holland and the victor of Hohenlinden to perish? It would be unjust to think so. Did he leave Moreau to suffer? The two years' confinement to which he was sentenced and during which he might have found occasion to get rid of him had he harbored a thought of so doing? No, for on the night of the very day that Moreau solicited by letter permission to go to America, he granted him leave to depart. I was the person whom the First Consul sent to him in the temple to communicate his consent and to make arrangements with him for his departure. I gave him my own carriage and the First Consul paid all the expenses of his journey to Barcelona. The General expressed a wish to see Madame Moreau. I went myself to fetch her and brought her to the temple. These, I think, were attestations, which 
I was not obliged to pay. Thus terminated this long affair. It was during the proceedings that the form of government changed once more in France. Chapter 9. This event requires some development. These so oft repeated enterprises against the life of the first consul began to excite alarm. He had hitherto been preserved from them, but the efforts for this purpose might not always be so fortunate. Up to this time, it had been supposed that he was threatened only by a few violent Jacobins, and people tranquilized themselves with the idea that the political fervor must cool sooner or later. But they had already been forced to acknowledge that it was not Jacobins who had prepared the third Nivos, as attempts had been made to persuade the public. In George's affair, it was not possible to doubt for a moment the object which had armed the conspirators and the party to which they belonged. From all these reflections flowed the natural consequence that some power or other wished to destroy the first consul, that it might possibly succeed. That if this calamity should happen, France would be without strength or guide amid the elements of discord and revolution of which it could not be denied to be still full, and that thenceforth it would be liable to be subjected to the yoke. The returned emigrants... And they were very numerous. We're afraid to see the power wrested from a hand which had the strength to protect them. The patriots feared the return of the House of Bourbon. And the reaction which, as they concede, must be the inevitable consequence of it. All minds were weary of commotions and satisfied with the port in which the revolution had been laid up in safety from fresh storms. On all sides, people were alarmed at the bare idea of seeing the first consul cut off, and they seriously set about remedying so much in this form of government as tended to make us uneasy and to encourage our enemies. The first idea was to appoint a successor to the first consul, but this measure, besides being unconstitutional, might perhaps have hastened the death of him who it, whose projectors wish to preserve ambition is impatient. After turning over and thoroughly examining the histories of all revolutions, they reverted to the monarchical form of government, which fixing the order of inheritance ensured the succession to power without convulsions and destroyed at least that part of the hopes of our enemies. It was not without considerable trouble that the majority of opinions were brought over to the adoption of this measure. It was only upon the breach that the old friends of liberty signed this capitulation, but at last, monarchical ideas were adopted. They were propagated, and they struck root with astonishing promptitude. Fouché only sought occasion to climb again to power, spread them in the Senate and among the men of the Revolution with the zeal of a new convert. In the army, the proposed change went down of itself. This is easily accounted for. The dragoons who were all collected into divisions of four regiments each and preparing to approach Bologna, gave the first impulsion. They sent an address to the first consul in which they alleged that their efforts would be of no service if wicked men should succeed in taking away his life, that the best way to thwart their designs and to fix the irresolute was to put the imperial crown on his head and to fix that dignity in his family. After the dragoons came the cressiers, then all the corps of infantry, and then the seamen, and lastly those of the civil orders who wished for the change followed the example of the army. This spirit spread in an instant to the smallest parishes. The first consul received carriages full of such addresses. Pains were taken, I dare say, to foment the zeal. But at any rate, the bodies of the state were assembled. These documents were communicated to them, and independently of their deliberations, all these manifestations of a desire for the restoration of the monarchical system were submitted to the sanction of the people. A register for the reception of votes was opened in every parish in France, from Antwerp to Perpignan and from Brest to Montseny. I am not sure that Piedmont was comprised in it. It was the summary of all these votes laid before the Senate that formed the basis of the process verbal of inauguration of the Bonaparte family to the imperial dignity. This process verbal in the archives of the Senate, which went in a body from Paris to St. Cloud to present it to the first consul. Mr. Cambaceres read a very excellent speech, which concluded with the statement of the number of votes and in consequence proclaimed with a loud voice Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French. 
The senators placed in a line facing him vied with each other, repeating, Vive la Peur! and return with all the outward signs of joy to Paris, where people were already writing epitaphs on the Republic.